I'm Hannah from Answer the Public. If you've been on any of our webinars before, you will know that each month we talk about how you can use um, search data to read people's minds and to help you make better business decisions. Today, we're joined with one guest, Sophie Coley. Sophie is the regular guest on our webinar series. What we're doing today is we're gonna go back to one of our first webinars that we ever did. We first ran this one in April 2020, I think it was, Sophie, wasn't it? Which yeah, was a, like a long time ago. And obviously a lot's happened in the world since we ran that webinar. So we thought it'd be a great time to do a refreshed version of the fundamentals of search listening. So this is really going back to basics for anyone that's new to search listening, anyone that's new to answer the public, we'll obviously talk about the tool at some point during the webinar, or anyone that just has used search listening but wants a refresh, it'll be really good for you guys as well. We use the hashtag search listening. And Sophie is one of the originators of the search listening tech links. You, you say this often and I, I always think I really should pay homage more. I think I do in most webinars, but I guess I cottoned on to the idea if you like having read Everybody Lies by Seth Stevens Davidovitz. So I think if we're being fair, I would call him the originator, but it's certainly an area that I'm passionate about. And I'm um, now working to try and educate people around search listening and its possibilities. Thanks, Sophie, for that intro. And we'll really go into the detail on how this search listening technique originated shortly. But first of all, I just wanted to start off by saying, please do ask questions as we go through the session today. We have got Stella who works at Answer the Public. She is in the chat. So she'll be fielding any questions, answering any as we go along. I will also jump in if there's anything that's relevant to a point that Sophie's talking about. So please do share your questions. And we've also got time at the end of the session as well. So stick around for that. And please do share on Twitter. We've got the hashtag search listening. It's in the bottom right hand corner. Please get involved in conversation. We'd love to see what you've got to say. Finally, we get asked quite regularly, will I get a recording of this webinar? You will do. Everyone that has signed up to the session will receive an email tomorrow, which will have the recording in it, but it will also be added to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com answer the public. And we have got all the recordings of all of our previous webinars on there, as well as lots of different how to videos giving you tips on how you can get the most out of Answer the Public as well. Cool, so let's just dive straight into the first question then for Sophie. What is search listening and why should everyone care about it? Why is it so <laughs> important? <laughs> okay, here we have, I, I've put together a bit of a definition of what search listening is to me, shall we say. So the key thing here, you can read this at your leisure, but the monitoring of Google searches for thoughts and searches around your brand or specific keywords or topics or your competitors or the industries that you operate in and then followed by an analysis to gain insights to act on those opportunities. I think actually in putting this definition together I borrowed a pre-existing definition that I'd seen of social listening and social listening potentially is a term that you have heard. It's certainly a much more established process and industry than search listening is. I'm hoping to change that. But yeah, it's very similar to social listening, but we're using a completely different data set. But all the, the things that hold true from social listening, so the fact that we're trying to understand people by how they behave online are very much there. But we're using Google data primarily. I do say Google and I'll refer to Google a lot throughout this session today. I, I do that because it's the dominant search engine in the UK and certainly in the US. But this, I guess the theory of this holds true no matter where you are. Think about search engines and the data that you can get from search if you like. I've talked about social listening a little bit already and I always think it's useful to draw out the differences between search and social and hopefully this will illustrate for, for anyone who's not sure what the value is in looking at search data potentially as well as social data. I'm never saying one or the other. So it's a bit like social listening, but with search data, like I said, on the left here, I've got a screen grab from looking at the hashtag sunbathing in Instagram. And it's lots of people doing that very kind of uh, rare activity in the UK of sitting out in the sun versus on the right here, Google suggestions when someone has started typing how to treat sunburn. And you can see how to treat sunburn blisters on face, fast at home, on scalp and so on. The idea here is these could be the same people, right? This could be someone who's gone and spent a day in the sun, particularly as I say, us Brits who are, get overexcited as soon as the sun comes out and has got to sunburn. And that evening at home is Googling how to treat sunburn on my face, whatever it is. Potentially it's the same people, but we bet we, 
we display very different behaviors typically on social media to what we do in search and I don't think we've got it in here but I have to again pay homage to Stella who's in the chat with you who absolutely nailed this with a line that she came out with on one of our webinars previously which is this idea that we live our best lives on Instagram and on, on social media and we live our real lives in Google and that's why uh, this data is so rich so I've got a few other examples for you here and this is very generalistic at this at this point but it's just to hammer home the point cat owners the hashtag my cat on instagram lots of very cute fluffy cats my cat in google you can see the top suggestion when i took this screen grab was my cat from hell but then it's my cat stares at me my cat keeps sneezing keeps being sick so it's the real life nitty gritty not such nice stuff that's going on there but again this could be an owner who's super proud of their cat and wants to show their cat off on Instagram, but equally is concerned about a behavior or something and therefore is turning to Google for that. Similarly, new parents, lots of very cute babies under the hashtag of newborn baby on Instagram. And then in Google, you've got newborn baby is constipated, is wheezing, is congested, is sick and so on. So I always, these sorts of new newborn baby searches, I always anticipate this could be a mum or a dad up in the middle of the night and baby's not sleeping and seems poorly, who is it that they turn to in that real crisis moment? It's typically going to be Google. And that's why you can get these really rich insights. Again, I've said it before, and I think Stella's just shared it um, in the chat, but the book Everybody Lies by Seth Stevens Davidovitz has loads of brilliant examples of where online and search data has revealed real truths from people. And there's a line that he says, which is that, we tell Google things that we don't tell our partner, our best friend, our doctor. We wouldn't put in a, a survey, that kind of thing. We're very truthful with Google because it's anonymous. It's not overtly tied to us, although it is there in our search history. That's not a public facing thing usually. So we can be very truthful and it, we use it to meet the needs that we have. I think I have one more example and this one I quite like. So not Instagram this time. This is a screen grab from Twitter, but this is somebody saying, HSBC, which is their bank, when they see the £100 I've just deposited into various betting sites when I'm a grand into my overdraft. They've then posted a meme, which is of Eddie Hearn, the kind of boxing legend. But effectively, what they're doing with this tweet is making light of the fact that they've that they're very broke, they're in their overdraft already, and they're still spending money on gambling sites. So it's it's a curious behaviour to me anyway, in terms of that someone overtly on social media making light of a fairly serious sort of financial situation but again that's the public facing version of them that they're they're putting out there it's potentially a bit of bravado that they're trying to play down the fact that they are broke again in google and it might be the same person it might not but this could be the person saying why would a bank cancel my overdraft or i can't get out of my overdraft and they're looking for advice and solutions in google even if they're making light of the situation on social media. So hopefully this is starting to help you to understand the differences because as much as there's loads of tools out there now and a lot of people are quite comfortable doing social listening to understand consumers, to understand people, to help with marketing and business planning, I don't think there's as many people jumping um, into search to the same extent. And for me, it's a real blind spot because there's so much rich data that you can get out of there. Just to give you some numbers are always good. There's over three and a half billion searches happening on Google every day and 1.2 trillion searches happening per year worldwide. That's according to Internet Live Stats. So the data set that we're talking about here is absolutely huge. This is a huge, rich pool of data that you can be tapping into, which is one of the things that's really exciting about it. And Rand Fishkin, I don't know if there's anybody uh, on the webinar today who works in more traditional search marketing, but Rand Fishkin has done a lot in that world over the years. He did some research that said over a third of all searches contain four or more words. And why that's important, I guess, is because you might think people turning to search to Google, it's largely because they want to buy something, particularly, again, given the last sort of year, two years that we've had now, online shopping, certainly in the UK, has really taken off and, and people are more comfortable than ever before buying something online. But if they're going to do that, they're probably just going to go to Google and search running shoes, for example, and that's two words. So the more commercial, like I want to buy something searches are typically shorter, whereas longer searches are typically questions or more specific statements because you're looking for information, you're looking for advice, you're looking for a community that can support you around something. So if you think of it in that way, then at least a third of the trillions, billions of searches that are happening every day 
are real human like emotive searches that we could be tapping into to, to understand people better. And another stat that we really like. So this is from 2017, but I've seen Google say effectively they've not updated it because it's still a similar level. I find that curious because I think potentially it's more given the world that we're in now. But Google reckon I've seen between 15 and 20 percent of daily searches have never been seen before. So that means 15 percent of everything that people are typing into Google on a daily basis are completely new things. And I think if you think uh, again about the year that we've had, yeah, it's never, ever been more important to be able to understand the fast changing needs, behaviours and attitudes of people than in the last two years. The world has changed a lot in the last two years. I don't need to tell anyone on this call about that, I'm sure. But for me, as someone who works in marketing, I, I didn't say in my intro, but I split my time between trying to educate people around search listening and, and helping them to get more out of it. And I also work as a director of strategy in a search marketing agency. And the work that I've been doing for the last year or two, it has been so important to really understand people and how their feelings have changed as different things have come into play. And that's where we've really added value for our clients. So for me, search listening is a brilliant way to, to be able to do that and to understand people and keep on track of how they feel and what they need. Oh, I think at this point, I was just going to jump in to show you what I mean by this. At the start of last year, when coronavirus first started to be, be a thing in the UK, or we started to hear a lot more about it, I started tracking on a daily basis the term should I. And I was looking at what are the autocompletes that, that Google was serving up if I typed should I, and they changed on a daily basis. So again, if you've been on searchlistening.com, you might have seen this. I'm just going to share my screen. Now, this is going to come out a little bit blurry, I think, because the webinar software that we use doesn't like me showing you videos. But I think Han Stella is going to pop a link in the chat for you to look at this page yourself. So you may want to do that. It will just be a little bit clearer and less stuttery. But I will just hit replay on here. What you can see here is the top 10 should I searches that Google was serving up in its auto suggestions on a daily basis from the 2nd of March and we went through to I think perhaps the end of April maybe even into May and you could see at the start it was all around should I go to certain places should I go to different countries and here we are by the 16th 17th of March you could see things like should I go to the gym should I go to work with a cold you started getting should I close my business towards the end of March should I contact my ex was one that came through that I thought was really interesting because I guess potentially that's people thinking we're in a really weird place now. Maybe I better just check in on the people who've been in my life. Should I go to work with a cold? Should I buy shares now? That was very much when the stock market started wobbling a little bit over here and people were asking, should they hold on to their shares or let them go? Um, through to, should I wash my shopping? We saw midway through April where people started becoming concerned about the fact that coronavirus could be on the shopping that, that they're bringing into their house. Should I self-isolate came in at the end of April and it was the first time that kind of language had really been used. I don't think at the start of 2020, people were talking about self-isolating. It wasn't really a thing. So, yeah, you can look at this yourself in your own time, like I said, but it was so interesting to track Should I and to see those daily changes based on people's biggest concerns at that point in time. And search data was really enlightening for me for that. So hopefully you'll find that interesting, too. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Sophie. I can see that lots of people are really enjoying the graphic. Um, in the chat. So Stella has actually shared it in the chat, but we will also send it to you with the with the video recording tomorrow, along with any of the other resources that we talk about today during the session. I've just got a question that I just wanted to jump in before we move on. So two things, actually. Firstly, Nyla has asked, will we be showing how to effectively use Answer the Public in this session? We will be talking you through some tips a little bit later on about using Answer the Public and getting the most out of the tool. But we have got a full free Answer the Public uh, tutorial on our YouTube channel. So we shared that earlier. Again, that will come around in the notes tomorrow. Also, I had a question. So Robert was asking, I think it was when you were talking about Rand Fish Fishkin's stat. He was saying, I thought the nearer a person was to buying, the longer their question would be in Google. What do you think about that, Sophie? Yeah, so I guess that's talking about, so in search, there's this, uh, you, you talk about long tail searches, and, and that is true. You do get people who are very specific with commercial searches. So I think the, the example I gave was like running shoes would be 
definitely commercial because someone's looking to buy running shoes potentially if they were specifying men's size 10 running shoes that's obviously more than four words and that's a very long tail search so yes some of the longer ones will be commercial and they'll be specific which in theory means someone is really ready to buy because they're being very specific about what it is that they want um but you also get longer tail questions that are much more sorry long tail searches that are a lot more questions based and that's where you get the kind of richer stuff i think so a mixture Great, thank you. I'm just going to ask Stella to re-share the link to that visual because I think a few people um, weren't able to grab it. So we'll get that sent in the chat now. Okay, so we should move on to the next question then. Obviously, there's loads of research methods available to get insights about your, your customers or your target audience, but how do, does search listening compare to other research methods? Yeah, I should say on this slide, I'm very much generalizing and I appreciate people will use all different kinds of methods to, to understand people for the businesses that they work within and for. I've just drilled it down here to sort of social data, search data and survey data because they're three fairly broad but consistently relevant and important and useful areas. And I think the point I want to make here is that there's pros and cons to each and as much as I am possibly one of the biggest advocates for search data and search listening and using search data to understand people better. Um, that doesn't mean that I don't use social data in my day to day work. And it doesn't mean that I'll resort to a survey if there's a really good use case for it. So the first thing I would always say is if you're trying to understand people, think about your objectives and what it is that you're really trying to understand and then think about what's the best method to do. That said, there are some definite pros um, and cons around search data that I should highlight for you here. So I always think with, with social data, the pros, it's observed. And for me, observed behaviours when you're trying to understand people are largely much more useful and rich than putting someone in an artificial research environment, which you'll see I've got is, is a con in the survey data column um, or box because if you're whether it's a survey or a focus group whatever it is you're asking someone to recall how they thought or felt or behaved in a certain situation and that's fine it's not fine because sometimes you'll get people who lie not maliciously but because they're embarrassed or they just don't want to reveal that certain thing that you're asking them or you, you sometimes get people who just can't remember that thing. So actually observed behaviours for me are always much richer. And if you're looking at online behaviour, so social data and search data, it is observed because that's people going about their daily life and posting on Instagram or searching in Google. So the observation thing's great. Social data, you can obviously tie it to individuals, not necessarily, I guess you can't always get the kind of demographics behind it. I know Twitter particularly, it's hard to even get sort of gender splits and there's no age data there or anything like that. But you can tie it to individuals. So you could find the same person and compare what they were talking about in 2019 versus now. So you're able to do that and, and to tie behaviours and, and patterns to certain people. The data for social, it's time stamped and it's live. So you can look at it at different periods of time and again, compare, which is really important. There's tons of tools to aid analysis. I've touched on this already, but I think we're, as a company, we're quite good friends with Brownwatch, who are based in Brighton, where we are, who are obviously one of the biggest social data. I was going to say social listening, but I know that them and others in the industry are trying to move beyond social listening. But there's loads of tools that are really sophisticated and you can really drill down. And equally, again, the sample and scale of data is huge. I've touched on how big it is for search, but it's equally big for social. So there's lots of data there. But the cons for social, it's typically a projection, right? The behavior. I find this interesting because I know, again, certainly in the UK, there's been a trend that I guess that's been gathering momentum over recent years of people to be more authentic and to be their truer selves on social media and a recognition that we are all largely showing off our best selves. But as a very broad brush statement, consumer behavior on social media is is a, a big sort of projection, if you like. You're living your best life, as we said earlier. And equally, analysis tools can be very expensive. I suppose that there's a, a big range on the market, so it's down to you. But if you want the sophisticated tools that allow you to do really detailed, intricate analysis, then you're going to have to spend money to do that. There's a certain amount that you can do looking on the tools yourself, but it's really going to be limited. So on to search data, uh, again, it's observed. So we're, we're looking at people as they're, they're going about their daily lives. It reveals the most candid consumer thoughts and needs. And I always come back to this. If you think if you were doing research on how people felt when they had some sort of medical emergency in their life, 
I would argue that the majority of people aren't going to be posting about that on social media as their immediate thing. I suppose that there may come a point where they're looking for a community and they might start to do that. But I do it myself. If I get a headache or a weird symptom that I don't understand, I'll turn to Google and I'll ask, what does it mean that I've got this um, sort of symptom, whatever it is? I wouldn't go, I wouldn't necessarily admit to those weird medical quirks that are going on in a survey because to me that feels private and the sort of thing I don't want to tell a random researcher but I'm willing to put it into Google because I know there's a payoff there that I will get the information that I'm looking for and understand what's going on better. Search data is live and by that I'll come on to kind of the search data like the actual data I'm talking about in, in a short while but it's live it's always being refreshed and updated and it's very much in the moment. If you think back to that graphic that I showed you with the should I searches that was being updated daily and I could see that. And it can be analysed over time, like I've shown you again with the, the should I example. And again, I've already touched on it, but the sample, the scale of the data is absolutely huge. You've got a really large data set to be working with. The cons of search data, which you should be aware of, it's not tied to an individual. So I think I even saw it in the chat right at the start of the webinar where people said, I'm interested in learning about how a certain type of person searches. Previously, you could do that. There used to be a tool uh, that allowed you to do that and the company closed down, I think the year before last. I can't help that at all. It's a tricky thing with data and I guess the amount that people are willing to, to put out there, but people are willing to search in Google. So you can get the information, but you can't necessarily tie it to an individual. That said, certainly in a B2B context, you can sometimes think about the language that you're trying to, to spot in search. Um, again, going back to the medical example, you can look at things like someone using a word like contraindicated. And that's difficult for me to say. Contraindicated is probably a term that a doctor or a medical professional would use, but not so much a consumer or a everyday person. So there are little things that you can do, but it's difficult to tie it to an individual. And there are fewer tools to aid analysis, but there are some tools. And I can see in the chat again, people asking, we will come on to, to the tools that you can use and what you can be doing yourself, because there are tools. Hunts the Public is probably the best one that I would talk about. And that's not even because I'm biased on this webinar. Survey data, as I said, you can set bespoke research questions. So if there's something you really want to drill down into, you can do that in a survey, obviously, and you can find a sort of bespoke sample or audience. So it's not going to be huge all the time, but you can find that that professional community or women of a certain age who live in a certain place and make sure that you're just getting their information. And there's tons of suppliers that you can work with for, for surveys. The cons for me, like I've said, it's not observed, so it's performed. You're asking people to recall how they behaved or thought and asking them to be honest with you. It's only time based if you repeat that survey regularly, which can be expensive. Equally to get something at scale, it becomes quite expensive. So hopefully that gives you an overview of where I see search fitting into the research mix. Like I've said, there's pros and cons to each. So it really comes down to your budget and what you're trying to understand, I would say. Great, thanks Sophie. I think you'll probably come on to this when we talk about the next section, which is how you do search listing, because people are asking about tools, if you just said, but also I can see there's been some questions about, can you, is there a way to see trends, like Google trends within Answer the Public? I will say that is a different data source. Answer the Public uses Google Suggest data, which Sophie will come on to talk about. But yeah, maybe you can touch on trends, Sophie. In yeah, this. sure. So how do you do search listening? For me, the, the key thing you need to do at its most basic, simple, is to pay attention to all the ways that people will search. And yes, there are tools that I will talk you through Answer the Public in a second that can help you do that. But Google will tell you how people search within Google, because I think Google thinks it's useful to show you how other people search to help you figure out actually what it is that you're looking for. So if you search in Google regularly, some of these elements might be familiar to you. So this is if you're on Google com.co.uk and you literally click in that search box this is a relatively new I think it only came in within the last year or two feature but Google shows you at that point what it calls trending searches so this was this afternoon um, I saw it came up top top trending search if you like COVID-19 UK cases at the Lloyds banking group dividend Prince Charles and Boris Johnson with the umbrella there was an awkward thing where Boris couldn't put up an umbrella. There we are. Lots of things that, that Google have noticed trend or spike in search today, and it's serving those up. And it's doing that because it's thinking, oh, if you're one of those people who's also interested in this thing, let's serve it up and you can just click on it without even having to type. So it's trying to do me a favor. But as a marketer, again, this is useful and interesting, albeit this is very broad because it's just top level searches around stuff. The other place that you can look. Just 
while we're going on to the next section so someone's asking do you recommend to going into incognito mode prior to doing your first searches yes always if you're going to use like a google a google window to pull some of this data yes really good shout because if you don't google will try and remember how you've searched in the past and start serving up more of that stuff to you so you'll be skewed by your own search behavior but if yeah if you go into um incognito then you get like a aggregated view of your location i should say that as well it will be tailored to roughly where you are i did an, a little experiment on this where i got people based in different places I think in the world to start typing the same thing and they all got slightly different suggestions but nothing too wild I think that was everyone who was based in the UK your suggestions and, and the data you get back from Google will differ based on where you are but if you go incognito that's the best chance of getting a clean data set if you want to understand searches from someone or how people are searching in a place that you're not at that point that's where a tool like answer the public can become really useful alternatively you can use it. i can see a couple of people in the chat saying that you can see those trending searches it may not do it every everywhere or if it's showing your personal search history try going into an incognito browser so that's just if you click on chrome or whatever browser you're using you should have the option to go private or incognito and that won't have your sort of history around it so the second place that you can look to see how google is telling you about how people search is these people also ask boxes and you get those quite a lot now when you search for something example here how to become a gymnast and it's telling me that other people who've searched around stuff to do with gymnastics or the same search that i've performed are asking these sorts of questions so again this is a really nice rich data source that as a marketer, I guess if I was working for a, a gymnastics club or something, this is helping me to understand the questions that people have around gymnastics. Uh, interestingly, with the people also ask results, every time you click on one of these questions, it will um, expand and give you the answer. But that will also trigger a new set of questions that are related at, at the bottom. You can get completely lost down a rabbit hole clicking and clicking in these. It's quite fun to do, but sometimes you can end up quite far removed from where you started. But it's a really good data source. I was... <laughs> There is a tool that you can use to scrape this. We did a webinar with the guys at alsoask.com, but it's been down. I think they're, they're working on some kind of back end, some quite um, significant stuff. So it's not been in operation for the past few months, but probably worth keeping an eye on that if that comes back, because that's a really good way to, to scrape this. I'm lucky I work with some very clever people who've created their own sort of not externally facing tool um, that enables us to grab this data at scale. And so if you work with anyone else with those sorts of skills, you may want to get them to do that because this stuff is really rich and useful, again, from a consumer point of view. And then the final place is the actual Google suggestions, right? So I said earlier, you can click in the box. And it, for me, it was giving me the trending searches. If you start typing something, Google starts trying to predict what it is that you're searching for based on what it's seen other people search how they've completed their search those people in a similar location to you so gold medals space i would hazard a guess i guess we've got people from all over the world here at the moment but the olympics is probably one thing that's got similar like significance to everyone which is quite unusual so i would hazard a guess that if any of you searched i don't say search if you type gold medals and then space don't hit search into google you would probably get very different results to me. I don't imagine you'd be having the interest of the, the GB medals and Great Britain. It would probably say a lot of stuff around your country and how your country is performing at the Olympics. And that's the beauty of this data, right? So it's bespoke to where you are and you can pull it in from a different location, but it's Google trying to shortcut you as a consumer to getting to the search that it thinks you want to perform. Just but, while you're on that point, Sophie, sorry to interrupt, just because it's really relevant, a question that came up earlier, but I was just waiting for the right time to drop it in. Someone was asking, how do you get like a global view on this data if you don't want it to be specific to the region that you're in? Is there a way to do that? There's not because Google, because no one will be searching globally. Does that make sense? Because yeah. you have to, there are differences country by country, how we behave, how we think, what we're interested in. And Google is always trying to serve up the best, most relevant web experience to individuals in different locations, doing different things. Like there isn't, you couldn't perform a, a, a Google search in a non-location. Do you know, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, but it's, it's a, a, it doesn't like logically make sense because you have to have a location, right? Yeah, cool. That makes sense. I understand why like you may just want, you may want to aggregate all the data, which I guess you'd need to do manually and start trying to combine stuff. But typically you do need to, to select a location. Yeah. 
so yeah, Google suggestions, this is my favorite data source because you can get quite bespoke with the sorts of terms that you're using. So my should I infographic thing that I showed you, this was me exactly what I did every day. I looked at should I, and I looked at what the top suggestions were and they trended. But that should I one that I did, that was, I literally did that manually. Every day I went into Google and um, typed out the top 10 suggestions that I've seen. What I could do is go into answer the public. So answer the public, if you're not familiar with where it's come from, then answer the public scrapes all of these. So every time you're um, typing something into answer the public, it's the same as going into a Google browser and typing that thing. So you get to do it at scale and much quicker. So it looks like this. I'm sure you are aware if you're here on this webinar. If not, I'll jump into answer the public in a second. But this example I've got here, it's like I've gone into Google and typed where the Olympics are the Olympics, can the Olympics, why the Olympics, who the Olympics, how the Olympics, and a whole ton of, of other search terms or sort of bridge terms, as I like to call them. And it's done that at scale for me and generated it in a couple of seconds usually it runs the report so it gives you a huge amount of data in a much quicker um, time format which is where it becomes really useful i always sh should say here if you're not familiar again the gradient on the dots here is like the order that you'd get it in google if sorry navigating between slides if this was coming up in an answer the public wheel then gold medal olympics would have the darkest green dot next to it and it would get progressively lighter as it comes down so again you can think of it as trending the darker the dot or the higher up in this list then the more popular it is right now because google anticipates people being lazy and thinks let's just make them move their mouse or their keypad once to to get to this one because it's the most popular term so what i will do now is just jump in to answer the public very quickly and give you a very quick run through for anyone who's not familiar with it. Just while you're opening that up, someone's asking if there's a limit on how many searches you can do a day and answer the public. If you're using the free version, it completely depends on um, how many people are using the tool at the time, but you can normally get like a handful. It could be around three-ish, something like that. But yeah, you can do three searches a day and you get a ton of data from that. I should say I'm logged into the pro version, so this might be slightly different to some of the stuff that you see if you're just using the free version. But yeah, so if you land on Answer the Public and you can type in whatever it is you want here, the useful bits here is that you can choose which country you want to see the search results for. So I will stick to UK, which is my default region. And you can also pull different languages. So I could pull data from people who are searching in German in the UK, for example, if I want, but obviously um, at the moment, I'll just do English and the United Kingdom. And then you can put any term that you want in here. We've put some little hints here. So use one to two words for best results. And all we mean by that is don't bother putting something like chocolate melt in here because we'll have will as one of the, the terms that we look at anyway. And then you're asking the tool to look at searches where people have said will chocolate melt. So you're duplicating what's already there. So go very simple and broad with this. Let's do exactly that and look at chocolate. So if we give it a couple of seconds, it will load. Just while it's loading, I'm just going to answer another question because someone's asked if the results in Answer the Public are real time from Google. Um, they are. And as Sophie's talked about, that kind of Google data is changing all the time. So it's you know really important if you want to track something over time to regularly run reports and answer the public. I should say as well, I think we're aware, again, that the webinar software that we use doesn't seem to screen sharing so much. So I'm aware this might be quite um, blurry for you. What I will try and do is zoom in. Hopefully this is a bit better. But what you get these wheels, chocolate is at the center of all of them. And as you've seen, you've got all, this one's the question one. So all different question words around chocolate. And then if I keep scrolling, the next wheel is more prepositions. So this is near and to and is and for. So chocolate for diabetics, for a chocolate fountain, for dogs, for chocoholics, that kind of thing. The four branch is one of my favourites usually. But you get comparisons, chocolate like, chocolate like food or chocolate derived from the pod. That one sounds like a crossword clue to me. You sometimes see those crop up in search data. Chocolate like minstrels. So that's someone who knows that they like minstrels, which is like a chocolate button type product that you can get over here chocolate like pringles i guess that must be like the shape of the crisp it's a bit like a, a duck's bill chocolate like ferrero rocher another brand that kind of thing you get some verses here as well so people comparing two different things and then you get the full alphabet so this is you in google again you've gone chocolate b chocolate c chocolate d and it gives you the full alphabet so you get an absolute ton of data here 
it does come through in this very visual format initially. I should scroll back up. You can click here and look at data rather than the wheels. And that gives you everything in a list if you're looking like this and trying to crane your neck to see the data. You can also here download it as a CSV so that you've got it in a spreadsheet and you can manipulate it or um, play with the data however you like. And you can also in the visualization view, you can save um, an image so that actually saves the image that you can embed into a presentation if you're sharing it with someone else. I always find people who aren't familiar with search data get very excited just at the look of these wheels. It's quite a nice sort of soft introduction for people into search data. So that's it really. I think for me, the biggest tip I can give you is to really think about this term that you're putting in. If I was working in a field where I was trying to understand chocolate and do some marketing around chocolate, I would be, I'd go chocolate, I would go my chocolate, I might go candy or something like that, or sweet treats, like think about going as broad as you can whilst staying relevant to what it is. The other thing that I always tell people is you get very different searches if you search chocolate versus more of a poss possessive term, so my chocolate. And what that enables you to do is to think about two different customer types potentially where Chocolate might be someone who hasn't, isn't necessarily a chocolate lover or is curious about something to do with chocolate. If you do my chocolate, then you're understanding the search behavior of people who already own chocolate or invest. Chocolate's a bit of a funny example to give you here. Flights versus my flight or radiators versus my radiator. Once you put that possessive word in front of it and you can pop that into answer the public, the data that you're getting back then is by someone who is who has converted whether it's with you or with someone else but you'll get a whole different kind of level of insights there than you would by just putting in a sort of non-possessive term and you can do lots of smart stuff in answer the public as well so you can yeah here you can start to compare the same search you have to do this yourself or set up alerts which you can do within the kind of pro answer the public i think if you want a really good walkthrough of it i know hannah's done um a webinar on that so look at the youtube channel and there's a really good walkthrough of how to use this but yeah you can start to compare as well and see actually is the way that people are searching for chocolate now different to what it was in december last year i would imagine it is because I don't know, chocolate in cold weather versus chocolate in hot weather is quite different. So yeah, you can go back and look at other ones and start to compare data as well. So there's loads of really great stuff that you can do, but this gives you all of that suggestion data at scale that you can um, play with and really get a good understanding that, of people. The feature that Sophie was just showing you there, because I know that somebody was asking in the chat about comparing data over time. That is a pro feature. So you would need a, a subscription for that particular one if you were looking to compare data over time. And what you would do is when you've signed up, if you've got keywords that you want to track, just straight away go into Answer Public, do a search, and then you can start tracking that over time. You can set up what we've called search listening alerts, which Sophie just mentioned. There's a separate, I'm not going to go into detail about that because we've got a separate webinar over on our YouTube channel, but you can set up alerts where you'll get emailed kind of the most recent data and the, the changes to searches around that particular keyword as well. So that's really useful. That is a pro feature. Just because I've seen the question there, chocolate versus my chocolate. I don't know what it's called when you do it, but if you're saying my chocolate, you're using like the possessive version of, of chocolate. And it's different because, I, I, like I said, chocolate's a, a random example. But if you did flights versus my flight, then the terms that you'd be getting back for my flight are going to be from someone who's potentially booked a flight and they might be anticipating problems or wanting to understand something. Whereas flights might be someone who's not yet purchased and is looking to purchase. So it's very generalistic and you'd need to think about what's the right way for you but you can think of, of the sort of general as someone who's right at the beginning of the purchase journey whereas my flights is someone who already has converted and they'll have different sort of searches and yes it was everybody lies by seth stevens davidovitz i genuinely at this point think i should be earning commission because i mentioned that <laughs> book so frequently but it's so good it's it's a date i'd say it's full of data but it's really interesting and uh human based and it's a fascinating book I'm going to end now just with some top tips for you to try and answer the public. So again, you could do this for free. You might need to, to try these out over a few days if you're doing it for free, because you might get hit the, the throttle. But think about that seed term that you're using. That's the most important thing here. I've seen someone just say chocolate marketing be a good search term. Depends what you're trying to do. I'd say if you're trying to understand how consumers behave around chocolate, then probably not. You almost want to try as best you can put yourself into the, the shoes of the person that you're trying to understand here. So um, not chocolate marketing necessarily, but you might put chocolate in. 
but I say that if you were trying to understand how marketers who work on chocolate products behave, then you might put chocolate marketing in. Again, it comes down to what you're trying to do. Running shoes rather than like men's size 10 running shoes. That came back to what someone mentioned earlier. So that's still a long search term, but it's very commercial. Don't put things like are running shoes waterproof in because you'd hope that's the sort of stuff you'll get served back rather than your, where you want to start. And try multiple variants. So go broad, like I said. So if I was thinking about running shoes, I'd have running shoe, running shoes, my running shoes and best running shoes, for example. So you want to think about all the different variants that you can play with and try running all of those. Someone's just said the way she says chocolate. Oh, my God. Is that because I say it in a good way or a bad way? I thought that was just normal speaking. These webinars make you very self-conscious. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I got I got into trouble for saying Nike on the last webinar. You did, right? yeah. Nike. Nike. <laughs> um, so the second thing I would suggest, just remember to refresh your data regularly. And I would put the question back to you in terms of how regularly you do need to look at search data. Um, thank you. I will take it as a positive that you love my accent. <laughs> so think about refreshing your data regularly. How frequently might the behavior change? So when, again, I go back to the should I suggestions that we were looking at, I was checking that on a daily basis and updating that data daily because we were living in such a turbulent time that I really wanted to understand from day to day how search behavior was changing and it was changing day to day. If you were doing this and there's a whole other sort of area that you can explore search data around understanding how your brand is per perceived, for example. Again, there's, uh, we've done webinars on this in the past, so look at the YouTube channel. But you might want to put your brand in to answer the public on a monthly basis just to understand actually how is search behavior changing around my brand? Has there been a big controversy that we might not have been aware of? Or do people love our new product and they're searching for it? And, and we can see that in search behavior. Again, if you're interested in this, the lovely guys at Answer the Public have actually recently introduced free market research based on brands. If you go into Answer the Public, let me just screen share again. Sorry, it's faffy to change between the two, but this is useful here. So in Answer the Public, if you, I think, I don't know whether this is the best place to go for it, but it's definitely in the footer. There's this free market research. So if you click there, or if you go to answer the public um, slash research slash collections, there's currently almost 13,000 brands that the guys are tracking. Hannah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is going to update on a monthly basis. Yeah, and we're going to keep adding um, brands to it. So if you've got any suggestions on um, sectors that we haven't got included in there at the moment, please just send them across and, and we'll add them. So you can see what the thing is that's being tracked and the territory, so like US and, and the language, so in English. And what this means is this doesn't count towards any of your daily searches. Actually, it's a kind of shortcut to, to get into some good data, particularly if you work for one of these brands. But if you click and click again, you'll get the data and that will be updating on a monthly basis, as Hannah said. That might be something that you want to look at. Now I have to get back into the slides again. There we are. So yeah, think about how frequently you want to be tracking it. Like I say, if it's a consumer thing in an area that might change really frequently, then you can go and look at it yourself weekly. And would you benefit from tracking? So one of the pro things you can do in Answer the Public is set up automated tracking. You can put your term in and then you can set Answer the Public to, I think on a weekly basis, refresh that for you. You can even get it set to email alerts. So you just get something dropping into your inbox to say, here's a load of new um, or newly popular searches around the topic that you're interested in, which is a very useful and time saving. Three. Focus on the different branches and languages for different insights. So when I showed you the wheel, I think I said to you, I love the four wheel quite often. The like branch, so we had running shoes like, that often shows aspiration and influence. So I think we saw it with the chocolate one, actually. It said chocolate galaxy, chocolate like Ferrero Rocher. The, the brands that show up in that for me are always the kind of the market leaders and the aspirational ones that people want or they're anchoring their search to that thing but they want something slightly different so the like branch is always interesting to look at influence particularly if you put something like hairstyles in i always love to tell people to do that one because you get the most interesting personalities that come through from that not the traditional glossy hair influences that you might expect but you get real women who women like their hairstyles of Four, the four branch often highlights audience segments. So you might see something like chocolate. For, we saw it chocolate for dogs, chocolate for 
chocolate chocoholics I think we saw there as well so that starts to tell you the different audience segments that you can think about so that's a really useful one as well and the with and without often shows product or service preferences so on the chocolate one we probably would have seen things like chocolate without nuts chocolate without milk and that can be really useful if you have someone in your business who is in charge of developing new products or broadening the services that you offer that kind of insight can be like gold gold dust to them and, and I've worked with companies who have used this data to do exactly that to launch new products or even to look at locations of where they should be opening new branches using search data to do that to, to understand where's going to be the best places and what what are the best new products for them so that actually leads me very nicely onto my um, last point which is please use search data throughout your business so I think I I came to get search listening having worked in a search marketing agency and of course search data is usually owned or used by people who work in very traditional search marketing so either or either trying to optimize websites to get them to appear in google or paying for um, adverts to, to show up in google they're the people who really get search data so if you know someone who does that they can probably help you but it's thinking about that data in a slightly different way and actually as i say using it to understand people because that can then help with your product development it can make your pr and your communications with your audience much better it can shape your business strategy it can help you produce really great content that people actually want to read and it can still help with your search marketing but my sort of rallying cry at the end of this webinar is go bigger than that right use search data reflects people's truest thoughts and you can be using it to make your business sort of go much further and faster if you can really understand it so i think that's it from me talking great thank you so much sophie i know that there's been lots of comments in the chat that people have really enjoyed what you're talking about and we've got tons of questions and not loads of time so let's try and see how many we can get sorry i talked through. a lot no it's all good i guess we can go slightly over by a few minutes if that's cool with you just so we can yeah get... all good but yeah first of all and a couple of questions i saw came up about this while you were talking but people were asking is there a way to find out the characteristics of people that you're searching around so the target customer so they've mentioned kind of gender age country etc how would you define that using search data yeah it's really tricky it's the one that you can't i think i said it earlier but there previously was a tool that enabled you to look at a certain search term or behavior and then understand so is it 18 to 24 year olds that are performing these searches or is it more women than men unfortunately that tool got closed down a couple of years ago and there's nothing that's ever come back that is at the same level in all honesty you there will be some tools that try and do that sort of thing but i don't believe that they're actually capturing the kind of good enough data i probably should have listed it as another con for all of this but you really are at the mercy of what google wants to serve back to you with this data and google doesn't choose to tell us anything more about who's there on the locations side of things i think again a few people touched on google trends google trends is a really great tool to play with sort of search data as well if you can put a term into google trends and then scroll down beyond that first graph that you get at the top you'll usually get a map based on the country that you're looking at and that will give you an it won't give you like a, a concrete score but uh, a concrete number but it will give you an index score of how common that search term is is in that location in the uk it's really annoying because the locations are england wales scotland and northern ireland but in the us i know it breaks down at a state level and similarly in south america i've seen that as well so you can get a, a gauge of is this search more popular in certain locations but you can't at the level i would love to drill down to demographics behind search data unfortunately the only other thing again like i said earlier if you're trying to look at more of a b2b audience if you use some of the more jargony terms that only people who operate in that world might use then that will help you but you then can't necessarily go off in the kind of research direction that you want to yeah it's tricky i'm afraid great thanks sophie just on the point of locations as well i saw that someone was asking about tracking in answer the public and how do you know if you decide to track a term that the results will then for the subsequent alerts and things that you get through be for the same region that you've selected so once you've done your search and you've selected your country and your language and you've set up an alert um, or a keyword that you want to monitor that is the location it's set then so it will carry on monitoring it in that keyword and location you don't need to go back and reset it obviously if you wanted to look for the same keyword in a different country and with a different language then you would need to go back and rerun the search but yeah it just carries on from that first search that you did 
Quite simple question, Sophie. What's the software that you used to make the, the graph, the should I graph that you showed us earlier? It's a online, super really cool data visualization platform that you can use called Flourish. I hope Google, uh, Stella can Google that and pop it in the chat maybe for people. But yeah, Flourish, they have lots of different sort of data viz options for you. It's a very cool tool. Great, thank you. I think, oh, actually, this would be quite a good one because I think you mentioned Bramwatch earlier. So someone's asked what the difference is between Answer the Public and Bramwatch. Would you mind just touching on that? Yeah, Brandwatch is very much, you know, I think they actually call it now, don't they, Digital Consumer Intelligence, so DCI. And I know that they've brought lots of other things. They're, they've got Buzzsumo and they've got, is it Curiously, but they've got some sort of live survey tools within their platform as well. Thanks, Stella, that was the right one, Flourish. So yeah, Brandwatch are trying to go very broad in terms of helping you to uncover, as I say, Digital Consumer Intelligence. And you can certainly run bespoke surveys within the platform. You can use Buzzsumo to understand content, how content's performing online. And you can use their kind of, I I, I forget what they uh, actually call it, but the kind of audience-based insights from how people are behaving all across the web, but largely on social media. As far as I'm aware, the last time I've spoken to them, they don't have search data within the platform. So if I go right back to the beginning of this webinar and think how people behave in social versus search. I think if you're only looking at that, you're getting one view of people. And sometimes that's the right thing. If you're trying to understand how a community forms around a TV program, then sure, you might want to look at social data because that's where people, you can do the second screening thing. People are watching the TV and chatting away on social to other people who are watching it. But if it's what drives parents craziest with their baby in the middle of the night then search might be better so again I come back to think about what you're trying to understand and then you can think about what the appropriate method is but as far as I'm aware I guess the one sort of blind spot to some extent is with Brownwatch's search data. Great thank you you touched on this one already but just to clarify someone was asking how true to, do we take the suggestions that are in that Google serves up and is Google leading us is if you could just clarify that one, that'd be brilliant. It's a really good point. I can't remember the stat off the top of my head, but it is in one of our probably two or three of our previous webinars. In fact, I'll dig it out and we'll send it around on the notes that come out with the email following this. But there's a stat around how many people actually click on those suggestions that you get from Google. And it's quite a high proportion of people. So that would indicate that they are good suggestions because, yeah, people wouldn't be clicking on them if they weren't actually the thing. There is another side to that, though, that is is interesting and relevant and true. And it's something we've touched on in, in more of the kind of reputational PR based webinars that we've done. So, again, go and look at those if you're interested. You can think of the suggestions that Google is per performing, particularly around a brand. They inform opinion as much as they reflect consumer opinion. So if you're looking at your brand, the examples I always give, are, does X brand use palm oil or use slave labor? And if your brand is showing in that, it might be that someone started searching for that thing because they thought another brand did that bad thing. And then they suddenly see your brand in that list and it makes them think, oh, I'd never considered that they might have done that. And then they might click. So to some extent, those suggestions will inform opinion. I think that's more around controversial or more brand areas. Largely, the data suggests that they are quite useful and, and they must be reflective of what people are searching. Um, and I always come back to Google is ultimately trying to get as many people using as Google using Google as possible because then it's able to make more money through its advertising platform. So Google wants to serve up the best suggestions and give people the best user experience because um, it's in its best interest to do that effectively. Great, thank you. Someone's also asked if results in answer the public will vary for the same search term if you're searching in a different region. I can answer that one. They will because it just completely depends on how people are searching around that particular topic in that location at that time. I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, Sophie. Yeah, just I guess it, in answer the public, if you're choosing two different locations, yes, and that's something you can compare. And that's where you get quite interesting cultural insights. And the same in actual Google suggestions. If you searched or started typing something and then got your mate who lived the other side of the world to do the same thing, you would see different, which I think is what they're getting at. Great. I think that's it for questions. The last point, someone actually asked, I, I don't watch Downton Abbey. I don't know if you, <laughs> if you, if you saw that question, Sophie. But I did, but I don't watch it either. 
Oh, I, it's one that's on my list to binge, but someone's asked if I moonlight as Anna Bates, so I'll be going and Googling who Anna Bates is <laughs> as soon as this session finishes. But yeah, that was a great session and some brilliant questions and lots of chat, which we love to see. Please do uh, check out our other videos on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash answer the public. Oh, and I sound like her as well. <laughs> Great. Please check out those other videos. We will be running another session next month. We're just finalising the topic. We'll have a guest for that one, but we will send you guys an invite to that session as well as you registered to this one. A massive, huge thank you to Sophie for running through everything. It was really great information and just brilliant to have you as always. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and thanks to Stella as well. Thank you, Stella, in the chat. And thanks to all you guys as well for joining. We hope that we'll see some of you back here again next month. Thanks, guys. <laughs>